community in the American West. He holds residencies at Wyoming U Cross Foundation, the Buffalo Bill Center of the American West, and is the associate editor of the papers of William F. Cody. He is also a founding director of the Gay and Lesbian Rodeo Heritage Foundation and the 2017 recipient of the Paladin Award. In 2010, he received the International Gay Rodeo Association's President's Award and served as Honorary Grand Marshal for the 25th anniversary World Gay Rodeo. So he's given lectures and opened museum exhibits across the country from Utah to Bozeman to the Eidelsdorf Museum of the American Indians and Western Art in Indianapolis. So the first time I met Gregory, I was just a little baby graduate student who had just started uh, researching my dissertation and I was lucky enough to go to LA for three weeks to the Autrini National Museum of the American West and I was working in the International Gay Rodeo's newly donated <coughs> uh, institutional archive. And as I'm sort of going through these amazing boxes of rodeo programs and posters and buckles um, and hate mail, in walks Gregory Hinton, who I had actually read a lot of his work and I knew that he was res responsible for getting um, the archive donated, making my dissertation viable, uh, and it's now book project viable. Uh, so for him to come in and shake my hand and introduce himself was incredibly exciting to me. And while I was at the Autry, um, I sort of got to see one of Gregory's greatest accomplishments um, which was the negotiation of having the iconic intertwined uh, shirts from Brokeback Mountain put on permanent display in the film gallery um, at the Autry Museum. It was really exciting for me and very hopeful to see these um, artifacts, these historical artifacts, lifted up among other um, film uh, artifacts and held in sort of great reverence, which was very exciting for me starting on this quest. Um, and then I am also very honored to serve on the advisory board for Gregory's brainchild, the Out West in the Rockies archive, which is the first regional archive of the LGBTQ Western, um, sort of dedicated to LGBTQ Western history and culture, which is at the University of Wyoming's American Heritage Center in Laramie, Wyoming. <coughs> so please join me in welcoming Gregory Hinton. <coughs> How's everybody tonight? Uh, thank you uh, so much for, for joining us, and thank you, Rebecca, for uh, that uh, lovely introduction. Um, so I'm just going to start. Uh, in 1960, Wyoming, I was eight years old when my dad, Kip Hinton, shot this rodeo photograph out at the Fourth of July Cody Stampede. At the time, he was editor of the Cody Enterprise, originally founded by Buffalo Bill. This picture was later included in Look Magazine's 10 Best Sports Photos of the Year, and a friend quipped, Kip, you've been shooting bulls so long it just came easy. Uh, so I sent this image to Tucson's uh, great rodeo and equestrian photographer, Louise Al Serpa, who, after high praise, observed that the best rodeo photographs chronicle unfolding failure, be it rider or beast. And Serpa was a change agent. She was the first woman the, prof the Professional Cowboy Rodeo Association sanctioned to shoot inside the arena. So nowadays, you probably wouldn't see a rodeo picture of a kid without a helmet on the ground under a flying bull. Um, and for me, it says a lot about the time, the sport of rodeo, and the hard scrabble life that of many rural uh, kids in, in Western states. So uh, a girl won the event, but she didn't get her picture and look. Um, I was uh, born uh, in the middle of nowhere 6.5 decades ago in Wolf Point, Montana on the Fort Peck Reservation, which is in the remote northeastern corner of Montana. So please don't think I'm denigrating the place of my birth by calling it the middle of nowhere because in fact, a few months ago, the Washington Post uh, reported the results of an Oxford University study to pinpoint the exact middle of nowhere in the United States. And guess what? It's official. It was Wolf Point, Montana. So, uh, <laughs> so, so that's where I'm from. Uh, we moved down to Cody, Wyoming when I was two. Uh, I happened to be gay, as was my wonderful older brother who I lost uh, way too many years ago. And for me, my dad's photo, it's also a metaphor for 
uh, rural western LGBTQ kids who were always on the lookout for some bull about to drop on them. And in a majority of states, without non-discrimination protections, bull can drop at the whim of anyone with power. Jobs can be lost, services denied, and housing refused. If you're wondering what my cowboy dad thought about uh, having two gay sons, he, and he said, and my mom agreed, better two than one, because they thought we would always have each other. And even with family support, like many gay men and women of my generation, my brother and I evacuated to the big city as soon as we could, looking for community, companionship, and safety. The culture drain of uh, this diaspora has been costly to rural America, which sees little return on its initial investment. Worse, we all lose a chance to get to know each other. But make no mistake about it, I'm proud to be from the middle of nowhere, I'm proud of my Western heritage, and by birthright, I'm a stakeholder in the past, present, and future of the American <laughs> West, as are all of you. So as, as we partner in our search, in our march for a future of equality for all, let's remember to partner too with history. Let us tell our stories and not leave it to others to tell them for us, because possibly they'll just get it wrong or they won't tell them at all. Cultural erasure is an act of violence. We must confront head-on those institutions who labor to invalidate the historical fact of LGBTQ existence. We did not invent ourselves at Stonewall. That said, I've noticed uh, that Western art museums, like members of my community, suffer from the irrational biases pe of people who don't really know them. Western art museums are often like the other in the community of the American Museum. But while many historical Western historical repositories claim to want to tell all the stories of the peoples of the American West, when I went looking, I couldn't find my community any anywhere. And then one day, as a visitor strolling through the Western Film Gallery at the Autry National Center in Los Angeles, I noticed that Ang Lee's Brokeback Mountain, a doomed love story between two gay cowboys, was not represented. Uh, could I ask how many of you have seen or heard of Brokeback Mountain? Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, it was, it, it, I noticed it wasn't represented, and it deserved to be. It was critically acclaimed. Over 10 million people saw it, and it grossed $200 million. Brokeback was on my mind because I just completed a 2009 spring arts residency at UCross Foundation in Wyoming. And please uh, note this, this is a wonderful opportunity for any budding writer, painter, or musician. A month-long residency on a 20,000-acre ra ranch with room, board, and studio sounded too good to be true. But Wyoming evoked an alarm uh, from friends back in Los Angeles, given its reputation for homo homophobia owing to Brokeback Mountain and the terrible murder of Matthew Shepard. 20 years ago this month. They feared for my life, which I thought was irrational and, and xenophobic, so off to U-Cross I went. And the first day, during an orientation drive, the uh, U-Cross residency manager started pointing out landmarks which inspired settings for Annie Prue's uh, beloved short story, Brokeback Mountain, which the film is ba based on. And I felt overwhelmed by how much I missed Wyoming even as I was there. And it occurred to me that there must be other rural-born uh, gay men and women like me who are missing home as well. Uh, just because our small towns might not want us doesn't mean that we don't still want them. And we don't stop loving where we're from. And from this longing came the idea of finding a way to give voice to our history and culture in the American West. So it's been over a decade since the release of Brokeback Mountain. Um, remember seeing it for the first time in your local theater, because I do. Um, rounding the corner, I was confronted by a long line of solo mid-century men like me, um, standing in the drizzling rain waiting to buy tickets, and I found myself surprised by an unexpected burst of emotion, and I was not the only one. Author Andrew Holleran observed that the sadness of Brokeback begins outside the theater. Blogger Joseph Denny wrote that it was the story of our wounding being told. And the fact that a 12-year-old clerk asked if uh, that would be a senior, sir, did not improve my mood. Um, I hated that I love Brokeback Mountain. So whatever happened to Ennis Del Mar? On the database of the Autry Library, I came across a folder on gay rodeo, and in it, a few rodeo programs, and a 1987 quote in the San Francisco Chronicle by a gay rodeo competitor named John King. A lot of people who grow up in rural communities come to the big city and then we lose our identities. The gay rodeo is a place for us to reclaim our heritage and be ourselves. It's, it's a place where we fit in. 
So I wrote Brian Helander, president of the International Gay Rodeo Association, who some of you have heard of, uh, which has 26 member associations, 5,000 members, and 50,000 annual attendees. Those are 2009 numbers. IGRA is a close-knit, service-oriented community, and uh, its members love animals and enjoy the country and Western lifestyle. And Brian sent me a letter of support, but he cautioned me not to get my hopes up. Yes, I believe that we have a rich history over the last 35 years, but they may not want to recognize our association's contribution to rodeo. And I asked if IJRA had kept up their archives, and Brian told me that they were stored in the basement of Charlie's, a Denver Western gay bar, in a closet off the drag show dressing room. Now, I want to point out, uh, this uh, lady's name is Nina, and that's her name over there next to Gia and uh, Felony. Uh, I knew Gina 40 years ago in a, in a wonderful kind of downtown bar called The Back Door. You had to go through the front door to get to the back door, and in the back door there was a cabaret, and it was, we, it, they were just, they were wonderful. Um, so anyway, um, after, I, after my conversation with Brian, I, 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 I sat down and I wrote a concept paper called The Gay Rodeo Legacy Project, observing that the LGBTQ community's contribution to Western culture was underserved in scholarly discussions about the American West. And the rural communities we leave behind were the poor for not getting to know us and we them. I then called for the inclusion of gay rodeo in the collections of world-class Western libraries and museums. But I needed another hook. Um, after another stroke through the Autry, I came home and I asked my partner of 27 years, whatever happened to those shirts from Brokeback Mountain? Uh, now, you all may remember the iconic intertwined shirts uh, that Rebecca just mentioned, worn by Heath Ledger and Jake Gyllenhaal in the film. And he remembered that they were sold at auction for charity, so I just Googled them, and um, they were purchased for $100,000 by a philanthropic film collector. So on New Year's Day 2009, I, I wrote the following email to a Mr. Tom Gregory. If you've ever walked through the Autry Museum, there's an exhibit called The Spirit of Imagination, and I hope one day, if only temporarily, your shirts might be on display in this gallery. And Tom replied in two hours. He said, when I bought the shirts, I thought I'd get calls from major museums offering to display them, and I didn't hear from anybody, and it hurt my feelings, not, not for me, but for the shirts, for what they represent. Nobody called but you. So they started out as $20 rock mount cowboy shirts, then movie costumes, and then with the auction, pop icons. And six months later, with Mrs. Jean Autry presiding and 25 members of IGRA, Western historians, artists, and activists, including the president of GLAAD looking on, the broke back shirts were installed in the Autry's Western Film Gallery. And on <coughs> On that remarkable day, the broke back shirts became <coughs> bona fide artifacts of love for all to see. And one week later, the pristine IGRA archives arrived at the Autry, driven across the Rockies from Denver by two gay cowboys. 18 boxes, 100 rodeo posters, rule books, rodeo shirts, silver and gold trophy buckle buckles. I went to Denver and I helped pack them myself. Um, so IGRA has been a great partner to me. And uh, Rebecca went, went through kind of how great that they've been, been, been for me, but she, she, she mentioned that I was the honorary grand marshal of the uh, 25th annual World Gay Rodeo. So I told them that my riding skills were a little rusty, uh, so they loaded me onto the back of a big black pickup and hit the gas. Uh, and I flew off face down in the dirt during grand entry. And when you get to an age and you find yourself rolling off the back of a truck, you're kind of like, this is like, how could this be happening? And, and down I went uh, on camera. So I don't have that picture for you today. Um, so the media response to the Autry's inclusivity was remarkable because it was just kind of unheard of that a Western museum would welcome my community so openly. Um, Los Angeles Times reported on it, NPR, Variety, Conan O'Brien even made a lame broke back joke on his show. Uh, the AIDS activist and playwright Larry Kramer sent me a warm uh, email to let me know that Custer might have been gay and did I know about that. Um, Annie Prue sent a note, I, I wish Mr. Hinton good luck with his work. And I got joyous calls from out Montana state representatives and poignant personal emails came from the Autry Museum staffers. I've never been prouder of the Autry, the IT guy wrote. Um, so the Autry invited me to create a Western programming series and we called it Out West at the Autry. 
and the mission of Out West is to shine a light on the history and culture of our community in the American West. We had some major sponsors sign on, HBO, the David Bonnet Foundation, the Gill Foundation, and Wells Fargo Foundation. And our first program, Whatever Happened to Ennis Del Mar? After that, we offered a hidden history tour and 200 people showed up. Um, and they were all taken in groups of 50 to four different galleries with waiting Autry curators and historians who utilized the collection to illuminate LGBT <laughs> Western history. Out West at the Autry brought top scholars from around the country to lecture. Inspired by Out West, our friend Mo from Montana, Patricia Nell Warren, author of The Front Runner, wrote an anthology called My West. Dr. Heather Hole spoke on American monarchist Mars, Mars and Hartley in the American West. Hartley was uh, one of our greatest American modernists, and he had gone to Germany in World War I, and he fell in love with a German officer. And when the officer got killed, uh, he, came to, uh, he came to Taos to try and, uh, and try and get past it. Mormon scholar D. Michael Quinn spoke of same-sex dynamics in the 19th century, a Mormon example. The artist performer Frank, who works in paper, created a whimsical cardboard out west general store inside the Autry Museum shop. So you might be following a pattern here. The Autry was literally letting me do whatever I wanted. And it was, it was just, hey, what about this? And it was, they did four, four programs a year with, with me. Um, Star Trek's George Takei came and spoke about growing up as a gay Californian, life for a Japanese American kid imprisoned in an internment camp, and marriage to his husband Brad. And we celebrated the fifth anniversary of Brokeback Mountain in partnership with Focus Features. Uh, we screened the film followed by a gallery talk in front of the shirts with producer and screenwriter uh, Diana Osana. And we capped the day with a staged reading called Beyond Brokeback from among 500,000 posts to a website called the Ultimate Brokeback Forum for people who, they, they call them brokies, like Trekkies. They were people obsessed about the film, and uh, rightfully so. And performers included Autry staffers singing songs from Meet Me on the Mountain, inspired by the film and written by composer Sean Kirshner. But I just want to interject something here. In addition to reaching out to the community with this programming, the Autry was surprised how um, important it was to the people who worked there. So it had an effect not only, uh, it had an effect on the Autry staffers as well as, as the outside community, and, and that's kind of how it's worked with each of these programs. So presenting uh, lectures, plays, films, and gallery exhibitions with uh, museums, libraries, and places of learning, Out West hit the road to Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, Arizona, Washington, Nevada, New Mexico, Illinois, Indiana, South Dakota, Oregon, and last week I was in Oklahoma. So the next great institution to par partner with me was the Museum of My Youth, the Buffalo Bill Center of the West. And in 2011, I applied for a resident fellowship with my abstract out west, west with Buffalo Bill. And in it, I offered to analyze the BBCW collection for evidence of LGBT history and culture. Now at the same time, I applied to the Denver Art Museum and I thought they would say no, <coughs> they would say yes and that the Buffalo Bill would say no, but it worked the other way around, so uh, it was pretty cool. Um, curator Jeremy Johnson liked the idea of this concept, but he'd only been on the job for one month. What would the board think? And that's what goes on for each pe person that I reach out to in these, in these institutions. They like it, but they're worried that it might get them fired. Uh, so he explained in an interview with the LA Times that outsiders like to come to Wyoming with their ideas on water, wolves, and gay rights, but Gregory was different. He was one of us because I was clearly a, a son of Cody. But before I arrived, I, I felt obligated to come out to uh, the grandfathers of Wyoming who were also friends of my late father. So former Wyoming United States Senator Al Simpson wrote me a deeply generous letter fondly remembering my dad, and he covered topics uh, like his famous HBO blow up with Bill Maher, which is something to look up, uh, his gratitude that I was faring well with HIV. I'm a, I'm a this year, I'm a 29-year survi survivor of HIV. His desire to see Don't Ask, Don't Tell overturned. His sorrow over the disappointment that California's Proposition 8 was causing. And a Vice President Dick and Lynn Cheney's equal love for their two daughters, one straight and one gay. And in it, he included a copy of a big tent LGBT credo called the Cody Statement, which was executed at the museum in 2001. I read Al's letter often because it made me feel like a rich man's son, which I was not. And it's, 
you think about it, it's remarkable how much progress has been made since he wrote it. And he signed off with, and if you're thinking of coming back to Wyoming, get on back, it's home. And home I came. And they gave me the run of the BBCW, including the galleries and the McCrack of the McCracken Library and the papers of William F. Cody. And the curators of all five museums uh, made themselves available to me. Buffalo Bill, I was told by a Cody scholar, Paul Fees, was as unprejudiced as a man could be. So a friend gave me a weathered 1888 first edition of his story of the Wild West, and in it, Cody wrote that he was dined at Mr. and Mrs. Oscar Wilde's when he brought the Wild West to England in 1887. Five years prior, Wilde had conducted an 1882 American tour of 150 cities, 50 in the West, lecturing on decorative arts and aestheticism to packed houses and a derisive but fascinated national press. So when Buffalo Bill's Wild West came to London for the Queen's Golden Jubilee as editor of Women's World, Wilde wrote of the American invasion, trumpeting in part that the cities of America are inexpressibly tedious. Better the far west with its grizzly bears and its untamed cowboys, its free open air and its free open air manners, its boundless prairie and its boundless mendacity. This is what Buffalo Bill is going to bring to London and we have no doubt that London will fully appreciate the show. So quite by accident, I discovered this invitation to Colonel Cody to tea at the home of Mr. and Mrs. Oscar Wilde at their home on Tite Street. And later in the McCracken Library in the Wild West Invitation books, I found notes to Cody from Mrs. Constance Wilde. So it's, it's quite fun to imagine what they all had to say to each other. I uh, on, on occasion, I correspond with Merlin Holland, who's Wilde's only living grandson, and of this scholarship he wrote that it was utterly fascinating and a very nice footnote to all the family biographies which no one ever seems to have picked up on. He says, go on looking for that picture of Buffalo Bill and Oscar W. I'm sure it's out there somewhere and it would be wonderful, but for, this, for now this will have to do. So equally moving to me was Cody's friendship with acclaimed 19th century French artist Rosa Bonheur, who he met when he brought the Wild West to Paris in 1889. Benoit is best known for her masterpiece, The Horse Fair, which Cornelius Vanderbilt purchased and donated to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. In order to paint in the slaughterhouses and stockyards unnoticed, Bonheur liked to dress, uh, needed to dress like a man, but to do so she required a permit from the French government, uh, uh, re renewable every, uh, every, every six months. And the press was obsessed about this predilection all of her life. Uh, she was always being asked why she dressed like a man. Um, and uh, Cody's advisors must have known about it. But more importantly, three months before Bonheur met Cody, Natalie Mikas, her beloved companion of 50 years, passed away. You can understand how hard it is to be separated from a friend like my Natalie, whom I loved more and more as we advanced in life, for she had borne with me the mortifications and stupidities inflicted on us by the silly, low-minded, ignorant people. She alone knew me, and I, her only friend, knew what she was worth. And even before the notoriety of Buffalo Bill's Wild West, Bonor possessed a keen interest in the West and its American Indians. I have a veritable passion, you know, for this unfortunate race, she said, and I deplore that it's disappearing before the white usurpers. Consequently, in an attempt to re-engage uh, re her from the depths of her loss from Natalie, Bonheur's art dealer arranged for her to visit Buffalo Bill at the 1889 Paris Exposition Universelle in the shadow of the new Eiffel Tower. And in addition to finding a great new friend in Cody, she also found herself artist in residence behind the scenes of the Wild West. Bonheur completed 17 paintings, and I was curious to see if she commented about the death of Natalie in these circumstances. She freely roamed the premises and said, especially interested in the Indian camp, Observing them at close range really refreshed my sad old mind. I was free to work among the redskins, drawing and painting them with their horses, weapons, camps, and animals. Buffalo Bill was extremely good to me. And to repay him, she invited Cody to her castle at B at the edge of Fontainebleau and offered to paint his portrait for free. And when it was finished, Cody sent it to North Platte, Nebraska, where a year later his house caught fire. And he wired his sister Julia and told her to save the Rosie Bonheur and let the house go to blazes. So my month in Cody meant a great deal to me. I stayed high above town at the Thomas Apostle Center, an Episcopalian retreat which looks out onto the Bighorn Basin. Have any of you ever been up to Cody? <coughs> great. Um, every day on my way to the museum, I'd drive by the little house of my childhood, only two blocks away, and 
I feel so warm by the memories of my family. <coughs> and <coughs> I'm going to second Rosa Bonheur here. Buffalo Bill has been extremely good to me, too. And this is where I should underscore what an impact that first embrace of the museum to the kids on Cody had on me. To my mother, a museum was as high as you could go. Each year, millions of school kids from all ethnic and cultural backgrounds visit public institutions. So let's work diligently so that each child might see his or her face reflected back from our collections. With Gene Autry and Buffalo Bill as my partners, I felt emboldened to cold call other Western museums. The New Mexico History Museum in Santa Fe, for its Cowboys Real and Imagined exhibition, included the gay cowboy, a first, I believe, and hosted our Pride in the Saddle program. And last September, we mounted Sleeping During the Day, Vietnam 1968, a, a photography and letter, letters exhibition by gay veteran Herbert Lotz. He sent letters home to his family and his friends and to his lover, Frank. To, um, but I've been privileged to partner with the Idle Jorg Museum of American Indians and Western Art in Indianapolis for seven years. First, they offered a hidden history tour, followed by a reading of Beyond Brokeback, partnering with the Indiana Repertory Theater. And in this kind of programming, partnering within your, within your institution and with the community at large is, is kind of critical to, to getting support and, getting, and, and, getting, uh, and, and accomplishing your goal of, 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 of inclusivity. inclusivity. So, um, if you're ever putting some of this, one of these things together, just remember, y y your partners just really strengthen you. They, they don't compete with you. Um, we next screened the PBS independent, uh, award-winning documentary, Two Spirits. Uh, and Native American scholars assembled for a panel discussion following the screening of the film. So for Two Spirits, the museum also invited Indiana's Transgender Rights Advocacy Alliance to attend and to put up a table in the main lobby. And I watched one by one as senior museum staffers, including the president of, of the Autry, um, walked up to welcome Indy's trans community to the Idle Jorgen. I believe that that was a first in Western Museum history. In 2015, the Idle Jorg presented the Women of Basin, the, a Montana artist utopia, the only LGBT program accepted for Indy's annual Spirit and Place Festival. Montana's jazz great M.J. Williams recalled how she and friends established the Montana Artist Refuge in a mountain ma mining town, and then she blew off the roof with her trombone. Um, but the Idle Jorg brought the mission of Out West to a new level with a major exhibition called Blake Little, photographed from the Gay Rodeo. Blake is a well-known Los Angeles photographer, and he photoed me for Paws Magazine for the release of our AIDS film, It's My Party. I never knew that Blake was also a champion bull rider coming and so coming across his photo spread on, a, on Gay Rodeo at One Archives in LA, I, I visited his studio. And together we sorted through proofs he hadn't seen for two decades. And these hold up, we agreed. And of all the photographs in this, uh, of all the cowboys in this photograph, we lost half of them to AIDS. Knowing something about rodeo photography, and as with broke back the broke back shirts in the Gay Rodeo archives, I, I knew the good Blake's photos would do. Blake chronicles a proud tradition of a holy American sport from the action-packed arena floor to the rodeo's cowboy, rodeo cowboy's most intimate contemplative moments behind the chutes. And he allowed me to scan the ones I liked, and going down the road to coin a rodeo term, I shared them with museums all over the West. I just cold call and say, you want to see these pictures? And, uh, and finally, the Idle Jorg contacted me and told me that they'd like to exhibit Blake's photos, as it happens in tandem with a national retrospective of Ansel Adams. Thousands of visitors attended, and they now travel the world without me. Blake has since been exhibited in Salinas, St. Louis, Tucson, San Diego, and Rapid City. On occasion, I catch up with him as I did at the High Desert Museum in Bend and the Gilcrease Museum in Tulsa last month. Community libraries, too, with theaters, galleries, and visionary programming directors have been great friends to Out West. It's been said that a community library should be as comfortable as a family living room, where complex conversations can be held in a safe environment. When I felt let down that I couldn't convince a Montana museum to partner with me, the Bozeman Public Library stepped up, and together we produced a packed community reading of Beyond Brokeback, and 300 people attended an Out West reading of Eight, the marriage equality play by Dustin Lance Black, as part of the national tour sponsored by the American Foundation for Equal Rights. A young gay, gay man from Bozeman High School came out when he saw how the city of the community of, of Bozeman supported uh, the LGBT community. 
The Las Vegas Clark County Library presented multiple Out West at the Library programs, including Beyond Broke Back, Pride in the Saddle, Aid and Diversity Day, which was a reenactment of contentious uh, Missoula City Council testimony on proposed non-discrimination legislation. Members of Nevada ACLU and the Nevada Gay Rodeo Association were our readers. And the Burton Bar Central Library in Phoenix declared March 2013 Out West at the Library Month with four public programs. And to celebrate Arizona Gay Rodeo, the library mounted the first exhibition of vintage gay rodeo posters, photos, pins, and buckles in the public galleries. So Out West Programming has been invited to participate in Kennedy Center American College Theater Festivals, West Hollywood's One City, One Pride Culture Series, the National Coalition Building Institute, and the University of Wyoming Shepherd Symposium on Social Justice. So you may have seen uh, Gay Rodeo covered on CNN's documentary series, This is Life with Lisa Ling. So Lisa's husband is my oncologist, and when he asked what I'd do, I told him about Out West, and he pitched Gay Rodeo to Lisa. So only in Los Angeles would that happen. <laughs> in 1975, as a student of the University of Colorado in Boulder, I watched the first same-sex marriage licenses in the U.S. issued by my friend, Boulder County clerk Cleela Rorux, to six gay and lesbian couples. That same year, technical sergeant and Vietnam uh, war veteran Leonard Matlevich became the first serviceman to come out as openly gay. And former NFL running back David Copay was the first professional athlete to declare his sexual orientation toward men. I came out against the backdrop of this seminal year in LGBT civil rights, and I, I told my parents right away, outing my poor brother in the process. And uh, we had a family meeting, and it was pretty heavy. Our folks expressed great fear for our physical safety and concern that we would automatically be forced into lonely, closeted lives. And a month later, a theology student called my mother and threatened to drive me from Boulder with whips and chains. My dad grabbed the phone and promised to kill him if he ever called again. In that moment, I knew that no matter what, I would have family support, but the path ahead might often be difficult, and it has been. My dad later told me that he and my mom didn't want their worry to be my worry. So a while back, I began to wonder what the next best step, sorry, this is my family in happier days after uh, we all got settled in. That's my dad, me, my mom, and my brother. Um, so a while back, I started to wonder what the next best step for Out West might be. We needed a permanent place to secure our history and uh, the American Heritage Center at the University of Wyoming in Laramie agreed. So in 2015, we established Out West in the Rockies, a regional archive of LGBTQ history and culture of the American West. So I drove from Los Angeles over the Rockies uh, in blizzard conditions to hand deliver my personal and professional papers to the AHC. And after the months it took to organize those boxes, driving away, I, away, I felt relieved that our history is welcome in Wyoming. I'm going to interject here also that when gay men were dying um, in, in, in the 80s and 90s, often they might just be living alone in an apartment, and when they died, all of their stuff would just be thrown into the dumpsters. All their personal papers, letters, um, just the receipts maybe they saved from an event or whatever. It just all went into the trash heap. And that's why this was so important to me. I'm going to tell you something. I was just terrified. Um, that my manuscripts for my films and my books and my, n my family albums and all of, the, all of the birthday cards and the Christmas cards and the Valentine cards that my partner has given me over the years would just be thrown away. And so I'm not in this picture, but I'm in those boxes and I'm in there for as long as uh, the American Heritage Center stands, which uh, is, is, is a real relief. And, and they're looking in for and welcoming other collections if you know of them. And last week, uh, in commemoration of the 20th anniversary of the murder of Matthew Shepard, the University of Wyoming and the city of Laramie hosted a series of memorial programs. The Laramie Project, considering Matthew Shepard, Matt Shepard is a friend of mine, and uh, the Matthew Shepard Foundation was integral in putting this together. And so I was so proud that AHC used papers from our collection to create a display table for my program, The Matthew Shepard Story, in conversation with Rulin Stacy. Rulin was CEO of uh, the hospital uh, which treated Matt, and he acted as a Shepherd family spokesman. Uh, to research, this is me, and that's Dennis Shepherd, and that's Rulin. 
uh, to research our reading, I was able to hold in my hand Rulin's notes to the media from Judy and Dennis Shepard, one hour after their friend <laughs> passed away, which read, go home and hug your kids and don't let a day go by without telling them you love them. You can see that in the uh, lower, lower left-hand corner of the page. So in Tulsa, we screened Matt Shepard as a friend of mine on Octo October 12th, and this Saturday, October 20th, hosted by Empower Montana, I'll be directing the Laramie Project at the University of Montana in Missoula. So opening doors to LGBT visibility is not a slam dunk with all the institutions I lobby, and I've been told we're just not ready yet by a few museums, which doesn't make them homophobic, because I just appreciate the honesty. Maybe they'll be ready later. For me, the true mission of Out West starts with that first connection, not the final display. And I've learned the hard way to not allow my ego to gallop ahead of my mission. Because I'll tell you, in the beginning, I thought it was perfectly fair for me to ask uh, an employee of a museum to put their job on the line to, uh, to accept my program. You know, I, I figured, well, I'm, I'm, I'm out on the line, why shouldn't you be? And that just wasn't practical or fair. So. Um, for decades, I, I was afraid to come out in the West of my childhood, and for decades, I I'm, was denied myself the joy of its open space, its beauty, its history and art, because I bought into the West's antipathy, antipathy uh, to gay people. But don't let them fool you, homophobia is alive and well in progressive big cities, too. And I've been privileged to travel the world, but my greatest joy is to fly alone into Cody or Bozeman, uh, uh, and bend and pick up my rental car and point it to the nearest valley or mountain range. On these drives, I feel, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't put that up before. Uh, go home and hug your kids. Don't let a day go by without telling them you love them. Um, but on those drives, I felt the most like me. That's the Laramie Project. Um, out West has brought a lot into my life, and I hope that it's touched the staff and visitors of the institutions we partner with. And um, the 35,000 member strong American Alliance of Museums clearly understands that inclusivity in exhibitions, education, and programming grows viewership and membership. Um, Out West Storytelling Museums, a featured online discussion, uh, attracted 170 registrants from institutions all over the country. Curators from the Autry, the Buffalo Bill, and Idle George joined me for a panel discussion, and, and it was beamed out of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library and Museum, which was uh, really rare. The dignity a museum, a library, or university lends to diverse underserved communities by preserving and sharing our history and culture <laughs> is esteeming and immeasurable. And that's why I applaud the University of Idaho tonight. As I did Alan Verda, the curator of the Special Collections uh, Library at Boise State, who created the documentary film The Gay Life in Idaho. And on that same visit, I was privileged to meet with Out West uh, representatives Nicole LeFevre and John McCrosty. And coming from West Hollywood, I was intrigued that when Alan showed me around town and on the drive toward my venue, he conversationally pointed out which ordinary establishments around Boise were gay friendly, um, including the fine arts movie where <laughs> I gave my talk. Um, you know, and I had fully intended to posit how great it was that more and more LGBTQ folks could live openly in the rural West without fear before I opened the Idaho Statesman to a headline reported, reporting on the murder of a badly beaten Stephen Nelson. The incident was reminiscent of the facts uh, of the murder of Matthew Shepard. And before my talk, uh, they, all dis they were all discussing what had gone on and kind of wondering uh, how, what the result would be. But, and one year later, Stephen Nelson's murderer was sentenced to 30 years for a federal hate crime. This is a quote from his dad. Because he was gay, the hatred of another person was poured out upon him in a manner we cannot believe. Edgar Nelson, father of Stephen Nelson. So yes, it's still happening. I remember uh, noticing a young waiter in Red Lodge, Montana, serving a table of cowboys in the dining room at the Pollard Hotel. And he was just, he, f he was so dignified and graceful. And the culture class really struck me. And I asked him later how things were for him there, and he replied, at least I know I'm safe in Red Lodge. But then he uh, mentioned plans to move to Portland or Seattle. And as with San Diego, Los Angeles, and San Francisco, Portland and Seattle still serve as evacuation centers for the LGBTQ plus rural Western diaspora. And those communities have welcomed us, and we in turn have pulled our weight. Urban support systems coalesce to provide health care to the HIV AIDS communities. 
As in Idaho, openly LGBT representatives have been elected in Montana, Washington, Oregon. And major foundations such as Pride Foundation have focused programming to rural LGBTQ youth. And cultural institutions have, progre have progressed with exhibitions like the Smithsonian's Hide Seek, Difference in Desire in American Portraiture and, <coughs> and Art Aids in America at the Tacoma Art Museum and Blake Rodeo, photographs from the Gay Rodeo at the High Desert Museum in Bend. And from the basement of a Denver, uh, Idaho bar, or Denver, Denver gay bar to the reading room of the Autry Library, I was privileged to meet a, a PhD candidate utilizing the IGRA archives for her scholarship on sexuality and rodeo. And it was emotional for both of us. And five years ago, Dr. Rebecca Schofield successfully defended her dissertation at Harvard, anchored by IGRA, IGRA history and is now as you know, Assistant Professor of History at the University of Idaho in Montana, and I want to, I just want to thank you for that. <laughs> the American History Association, uh, Historical Association continues to monitor alarming declines in college and university history er enrollment and majors, and we need every history buff we can muster. Our state and museums and archives can use all hands on deck in the procuring, securing, and telling the stories of all diverse peoples of our great states in the Southwest, the Rocky Mountain West, the Coastal West, and the Great Northwest. And if you want to join a club, join your local uh, or state historical society and, uh, and represent the LGBTQ community in your votes. In my travels to museums and historical societies around the country on this and other subjects, I've witnessed firsthand how the passion of one can safeguard the history of many. And so it makes me so happy that, that newly minted scholars like Dr. Schofield and Western curators like Jennifer Henneman of the Denver Art Museum and Laura Fry of the Tulsa's Gilcrease Museum and Johanna Bloom of the Idlejord Museum have advanced in their fields with the knowledge that inclusion and diversity grows readership, viewership, and membership in places of culture and learning. So. Uh, I drove from Missoula to Moscow, Moscow yesterday, uh, sorry, uh, yesterday evening because driving is a Hinton family tradition. And in 2001, when my brother grew very ill, he asked if we could take a road trip through our past. When we crossed the Wyoming border and descended into the Bighorn Basin, the scenery changed dramatically and it was so beautiful we looked at each other and started laughing. In the BBCW's Western Gallery of Western, w Whitney Gallery of Western Art, we found ourselves standing in front of Charlie Russell's Waiting for a Chinook, which depicts a starving steer in a blizzard uh, as a pack of wolves close in. And he fell silent, and I, I was worried I had pushed him too hard, and I asked if he was okay. And uh, he then recalled standing in front of uh, the painting as a little boy and asking our dad to, to explain it to him. And as older brothers often do, he tried to comfort me because we kind of both knew what lay ahead for him. He said, I'll be all right, so will you, I'm just remembering dad. In 2013, I mentioned, I, I summoned this moment in my newspaper play, Waiting for a Chinook, which had its world premiere at the Snowy Range Summer Theater Festival in Laramie. And on stage, we recreated a library reading room, along with, um, pardon me, along with the newspaper morgue and my dad's office and dark room, and we had to explain to the young actor what a dark room was. Um, reprised on stage were images of my dad's old Enterprise covers from when he was editor, and so as we wind down, I'm gonna take a breath and share a few with you. So that's me, I'm the New Year's baby of 1957. I was actually three years old, so a big baby <coughs> even then. <laughs> Um, this is me, my brother and sister up Shoshone Canyon, which is at the east gate of Yellowstone. And my dad always told us to point in these pictures so it would give the, pic it would give the photograph action. <laughs> That's my mom, my brother and sister walking the rainy streets of Cody with our, our lab, Bonnie. <coughs> these are cattle coming home from somewhere, probably not going to a happy end. our neighbor, Elner Wagner. We called her, her name was Eleanor, but we as kids called her Elner. And that's my dad's favorite kid. He loved Labradors. That's me and Dennis Conley and Charles Herrick standing outside of the Cody Bandstand in the summer. Such a great shot. 
part of the goal for these photographs was it was in keeping uh, with Buffalo Bill's mission to uh, kind of celebrate and uh, advertise uh, Cody to the international community. So he was all for as many pictures as you could use. This fellow's name is Enoch Walker, uh, and he was, I believe, the 1960 all-around champion cowboy, and he later was killed falling uh, when a horse fell out of him, coming on a sh out of a chute. If you look closely, there's the three of us sitting high on that rock. My dad would do anything to get a good photograph. It was just so tiny there. And he is, you know, uh, he, he knew rodeo photographs, which is why I was just so thrilled to find Blake's photographs. That's the first plane I ever flew on. In that day, you could go sit on the pilot's lap while they flew the plane. I don't think that would happen today. This photograph, if you look at it, um, this is the Cody Rural Fire Department fighting a fire out at uh, Oregon Base in an oil tanker fire. And they're not wearing pr protective gear, they're not wearing galoshes, they're not wearing anything to cover their faces. They're men in their business suits out to stop this fire. And my dad collapsed in it, um, and they thought he'd had a heart attack, but he went down after he shot this, this photograph and was rushed to the hospital and saved by his best friend. But uh, <coughs> this photo won uh, the Wyoming uh, Newspaper Association prize for that year. And that's uh, Charles and Sammy and me, and I'm told that uh, the church still has those choir robes. <laughs> and here's, uh, here's young Rodney Goings uh, taking all of the uh, uh, heat away from uh, little Kathy Harper. So we should remember her today, too. That's Cody on the 1956 uh, uh, Cody Stampede, 4th of July. So long ago, I was sitting with my on my brother's deck overlooking the Pacific Ocean, and we wondered how life might have been for us as gay people if we never left Cody. So when, Cody, Scotty, pa when Scotty passed away, he asked me to scatter his ashes in Wyoming's Crazy Woman Creek in the long blue shadow of the Bighorns. If you look at this picture, it's like really only 22 years difference. It's kind of funny how things changed. Um, and uh, kneeling at the water's edge, I, I reflected that even after decades in urban Southern California, my brother longed for his rural, rural Western past until the end. And as I've said, these past years I've met a lot of uh, gay, lesbian, bi, and trans folks leading quality lives in rural Western communities. And happily, nowadays, not everyone leaves and some of us return. But without family and community support, too many young people are losing the battle to stake their place. So, you know, I was lucky. I had a scout and a guide. Uh, when I wanted to come home to the West as who I am, Buffalo Bill led the way. And I'm reminded that a few years, a few years ago on a, a rainy early morning drive up Shoshone Canyon just below Pahaska Teepee, which is where Buffalo Bill's hunting lodge uh, at the, was at the east gate of Yellowstone, I, I saw two lost dogs running, uh, running frantically down the empty highway. They looked skinny, cold, and wet. Uh, I stopped, but they took off. So out of the mist, a camper pulls up. And two women got out, and they were clearly partnered. And we all just kind of looked at each other like going, huh? Um, so they offered to round up the dogs, and I went for help. At the Pasca gift shop, a clerk mentioned that a, a note about two missing dogs had been posted for three days. So she called the number and told the owner where to find them. So ten minutes later, a relieved dad, boys, and hounds pulled up to say thanks. So three days those dogs were lost, and I'd just like to point out that it took two lesbians and one gay man only ten minutes to get them back to their kids. <laughs> Thank you. You can ask me about anything I've mentioned here, <laughs> or whatever else is on your mind, if anything. Please. Um, can you repeat what age you were when you came out to your parents? I was 21. I, I, would, I would add at the time I was told that I could tell them anything, and that we could always go with them, uh, go to them and tell them anything that was troubling us. And 
um, after after what happened happened, I I learned about deceit that I would need to I would need to keep what I was doing under wraps because it quickly went around the campus, um, and I ended up. Uh, dropping out of school, kind of in my third year. I was on the dean's list, I was getting straight A's, and I was loving what I was doing. But I dropped out and I, I, left, uh, I left school for, uh, for half a year, but luckily I got back. But I'm at an age where I'm going back and I'm trying to figure things out, like what's what, not to blame or whatever, or, or to you know, uh, pass the resp responsibility on to others. But I really look back at that period and you know, the university wasn't set up the way campuses are now. When I had a panic attack, I went over to the health center and I was told to lie down for 20 minutes. I was also told I was long term and I would need to get help elsewhere. But I, I didn't, I, I thought that I deserved to be, to leave school. I, it just, I, I so totally felt responsible because of, uh, because of, of, of this lifestyle I was living and, and things have changed so much. Uh, because uh, a university would never tolerate what happened to me uh, from another student. And by the way, this man has apologized to me and I accept it totally. He was egged on by his spiritual advisor and uh, he's a very wonderful fellow now and we're friends. But uh, uh, I, I just look at that time and I, I just, it set me on a path and I'm, I'm happy where I am, but uh, other people aren't necessarily so lucky. So, sorry, that was a long answer. Anybody else? Please. Yeah, Dave, uh, you mentioned a few uh, moments as a first gay football player and a first gay uh, uh, a soldier to come out. Um, did any of these have a big impact on you or the gay community out west? Or y yeah, I mean, it was, uh, the thing was to be out, like, to come out, be visible, and show people that we're just like everybody else. And, and so that was very, very courageous. And obviously, like with Time Magazine, these, these, uh, these acts that these three people you know, uh, uh, offered to come up with uh, really gave us all a lot of spirit. I mean, that was the time of the gay liberation movement. And, and being visible was, uh, was, was absolutely, uh, uh, it, we were inspired to be visible. Um, now, I was invited to go to, with a group of people, to Zappa straight dance at the University Memorial Center in Boulder, uh, which went, meant we all, just as men and women together, went out and danced in the middle of 300 people. And my roommate at the time heard about it, and so I got kicked out of the house. So um, there were obstacles to coming out, but I, I don't regret any of that. Yeah, please. I was 23. I graduated. It took five years to graduate, and I was in my car with my uh, guitar on the front seat with a cowboy hat on it to look like I, uh, I uh, had a companion, and I drove straight to Laguna Beach where my brother was living and uh, quite by accident moved two blocks from the Boom Boom Room, which is the gay bar in Laguna. I was used to driving 40 miles for, for fellowship, and I only had to walk down to the beach for it. It was, it was really something. California is a dreamland. Uh, if you get a chance, I uh, hope, you'll, hope you'll join me there sometime. Please. Um, what was it like being that, uh, the role of being the productive leader of the movement? Um, as I say, I was warned off of it. Uh, but when I got to U-Cross, which is, uh, it's, it's, it's just, um, it's near uh, Sheridan, Wyoming. It was so beautiful, and the setup was really great. And um, I had made it, I hadn't made it, I, I was working on a project about my dad's legacy. And so Out West came as a result of going there and realizing that Annie Prue had written the short story Brokeback Mountain there. And I just had all of these nostalgic feelings about being there and wondering why I had stayed away so long. And I knew why. It was because of Matt Shepard's murder in Brokeback Mountain. And uh, so, uh, I was really pretty instantly comfortable because I, I mean, uh, obviously we have um, members of, of our community and all of these, you know, communities. And uh, so uh, my goal was to get to know them and, 
And uh, you know, we, my brother and I had wondered how, how would life have been for us if we'd left, and I believe, if we hadn't left, and I think we would have been fine as long as we would have kind of had each other. Um, I did go to Wolf Point um, when I was 50, and I had just written my third novel, which is called The Way Things Ought to Be, and I'd been interviewed, and I had to call back to LA so I could hear the interview, my partner, to hold the phone up to the radio. And I remember just feeling bad that I couldn't tell my parents' friends kind of about my, they, they probably knew. And what people don't get is it's really cool to say, oh, do you have a partner? Do you, you know, people don't want to say the wrong thing, so they don't say anything. Um, but they were really, really wonderful to me. Uh, but I, I just, I haven't, I haven't <laughs> felt any nervousness whatsoever. Um, so uh, kind of in all these communities I visited, which is really pretty great. Please. Have your uh, opinions or viewpoints or feelings towards the Black Mountain Man community changed as you've gotten older? Um, yes, I, I was kind of kidding when I said I'd, I hated that I loved it. Uh, but I did go with a chip on my shoulder because I've been in the film business for many years and, and we, uh, you know, we do get burned uh, by kind of the the straight version of the telling of our stories. I mean, they're stereotypes like with any other community, but this was so respectful. And, and Brokeback Mountain has just been a great ambassador uh, in general toward people truly understanding kind of the dynamics that, that, that come between a same-sex same couple and just that terrible pull when they feel like they, they can't be together. And that's what it did. So I just really honor the film and uh, um, and uh, just the legacy. The, the two shirts really are two flimsy shirts and they're hanging pinned to a board. And people thought that the Autry had this huge uh, exhibition about gay people there. And it was just this one artifact. Sometimes you get that one artifact that just speaks volumes. I, you know, um, so anyway, I, 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 I love the film and I think that it, it, uh, it told a wonderful story. Now, I mentioned that I was HIV. Does anybody have any questions about a long life with HIV? You're welcome to ask. Well, good, then that's all settled. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't uh, expect to be alive to be standing here with you today, so I'm, I am, I'm grateful I got wonderful care, and that's, that's what it takes. And uh, I didn't let anybody tell me that I couldn't be honest about it. Um, uh, so a friend told me, oh, you'll never get dates now. And I said, well, I'm just going to go home to my partner now and ask him if he'll go on a date with me. <laughs> so, you know, I've been, I've been very, very fortunate. Thank you so much again. Oh, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much, University of Idaho. Thank you.